side of the screen to that. So MTQs and better sampling, and in particular SBAs, are the content validity and reliability than other um, constructs to assess knowledge. So in, um, in determining what kind of instrument we use in our assessments, we can have constructive response type questions or selective response type questions. And under the constructive responses, we have essays, modified essays, short answers, um, and then goal down the VSA, the very short answer, which I think would be our gold standard today. In the selective response type items, we have multiple choice, uh, true, false, uh, very easy to write. DMQs, extended matching questions, which um, don't necessarily um, fit all types of knowledge assessment. Script concordance, which I won't touch upon, but I think in the selective response type, a uh, single best answer would be my gold standard. So, in the, if we look at the selective response type questions, um, I'm just going to go through very quickly some strengths and limitations. And so if we start with the multiple choice um, true-false, which in my opinion is the easiest, right? Um, it can test a wide range of knowledge. Um, it's also machine testable, which makes it easy to um, administer exams on a large scale. But there is a restriction on the applicability to the type of knowledge you can assess with the MCQ true-false. Um, you have to ensure that everything is explicitly true or false in your options. And so um, it it doesn't it, it, it can somewhat be artificial. Um, extended matching questions are more reliable if you apply some psychometrics than um, true false questions uh, due to their increased difficulty. But they're not always applicable to all areas of medicine. So I teach in the early years of uh, our MBBS program. Um, and I teach explicitly in, in the sciences, and it's not very easy for me to have a long list of 12 to 15 EMQ options. For example, if I'm looking at the cell cycle, um, there's four phases of mitosis, so I can't have an extended um, matching question list of options. So there are different. And lastly, my gold standard in selective response would be the single best answer. And so they can test application of knowledge as well as factual core. We can uh, sufficiently sample across the curriculum and they are machine scorable, so they apply um, readily to um, assessment on a larger scale. Um, one of the caveats of SBAs is that they can lead to uh, learner queuing. And so I, um, I that. Um, I myself have taken some recent assessments uh, for various reasons, and I find that if there's a list of options there, I can I can I can wiggle my way through it. If I'm just asked a question, I may not necessarily uh, find the answer. And so then, if we look at the constructive response um, style items, again, there's some limitations. Essays. I hope none of us are spending lots of time. Um, reading and grading essays. They, they do allow for lots of flexibility in question setting. They do avoid queuing. Um, they're a high order cognitive process, but they um, are very um, lengthy in terms of testing time. They're very demanding in terms of faculty market workload. And often the task can be misinterpreted. Um, so I think if you're going to go down the essay route, um, you need a good rubric, you need faculty training, um, no bias, etc. So quite, quite labour intensive. Um, modified essays uh, will be a slightly shorter version and frequently used in um, uh, family medicine, clinical management. Um, again, if you have a modified essay, you might be able to be more focused but again, restricted to sampling knowledge in certain areas. And lastly, my gold standard in the constructive response would be the very short answer. Um, and this is where Amir is the expert, and will bring us on to BSAs um, later in the, in the workshop. And the, um, one of the, the major advantages of a BSA is it completely avoids queuing. Um, you can assess knowledge and application of knowledge, and you can cover a wide range of topics, so they're um, very useful in um, large-scale written assessment 
um, tests, and they can replace your um, traditional MCQ one written bar. So if we go back to my gold standard of the um, selective response, which is a single best answer type question, um, to write a good SBA, you need um, a short lead-in with um, multiple options, so we use five. Um, a scenario, uh, which is a clinical vignette, uh, which gives you sufficient information to assimilate the knowledge to um, allow the learner to address the question, uh, which is your leading. Um, and these uh, style questions can test knowledge and better application of knowledge, clinical reasoning, decision making, etc. And so you want plausible options with one being the best answer and the others may be partially correct. And the scores are, um, it's no negative score, basically, so it's a, it's a yes or a no. Um, so if we look at the options, um, we'd like them to kind of continue on, with the one option being the most correct, and the other options being less correct. So um, they should be plausible, and if you look at this um, range, um, D is the most correct, B is somewhat close to D, so you'd expect the learner to be choosing between option B and D, and A, C, and E are um, pretty much um, wrong, or at least correct. So in constructing a good SBA, we always want to keep in mind the purpose of the assessment. Um, we want a STEM, which is a clinical vignette or case presentation, if possible. Um, images are, are useful, so like an ECG, um, uh, an x-ray, um, a, a pathology sample, uh, blood smear, etc. Um, they give, um, they can uh, contextualize the question. Uh, always consider the length of your exam. So if you have a three hour exam with 120 questions, uh, you know, consider how much reading a learner has to give to um, answering the question. The leader must be clear and unambiguous. It must be really obvious to the student or the learner what you're asking. And so if you're asking for a diagnosis or an investigation, you want um, your options to be homogeneous. And that's uh, very important to write a good um, SBA. And your option list should have, um, in total, plausible answers. So we use uh, typically four to five options, which um, um, if you have less, you might increase um, the strategic student guessing. Uh, we want to avoid uh, the strategic student um, navigating their way through um, some sort of assessments. Um, in general, for our style, we list them alphabetically. So sometimes when I look at MCQs that are not alphabetically written, I think, well, it's going to be C or D. You know, let's game it. So if you write them alphabetically, you eliminate, again, the strategic um, guessing. And homogeneous um, options, so if you're investigating or making a diagnosis, it have to be investigations or diagnoses, not a mix. And the um, lead-in should be a very clear um, question. And I'll show you examples of some <coughs> logical and grammatical errors later. And so you might tell, why do I need a case vignette? Um, well, it gives context but it only gives context when it's necessary. And so this is an example of a lovely little short case vignette, 62 year old man with raised country blood sugars, he's a beta of BMI of greater than 30, and a new diagnosis of diabetes smartest is made. What's the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes? This vignette adds nothing. I could just say, what's the, what's the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes? It's an essay question. And so, um, If we want to look at that question and, and, and address what we're really asking of the learner, we can write it in, in a better manner with a game of case vignette with information in the clinical scenario that allows the learner to address um, a discrete question. So again, some similar type of history, um, hypertension, values of diuretic, uh, ACE inhibitor, uh, obese, and what is the most likely cause of his raised sugars. So this vignette is now asking the student to 
assimilate the information and, uh, and come to um, answering a discrete question. So again, it's another example of what I'd consider a good single best answer question. Um, it has a clear clinical vignette, and the lead-in is asking a discrete question, what is the most likely diagnosis? And Gina Barry syndrome is the answer. So I'll let you read it if you wish, but we can come back to it later if um, it's not necessary to read all the details. But there's enough information in the scenario um, to allow the learner to reach that diagnosis. So a gold standard in writing a good SBA is to pass the cover test. And so this ensures that the information you've constructed in your clinical vignette is sufficient to allow the learner to answer that question. So an autopsy is performed on a 50-year-old upper man who was found dead in the sheltered accommodation. post monitoring exam reveals a large quantity of blood in the upper GI tract together with hepatic cirrhosis, gastric gingivitis, mucosis, normal. Identify the single most likely source of the bleeding. So is there a sufficient information that been yet to allow you to correctly answer that question? And so by, by passing the cover test, make sure that your question is focused and clear. And so I would expect most of you to choose option D. So if you can if you can arrive at option D without looking at the um, the options, um, you you quality assured your your items be you know, sufficient. Um, and again, this is a um, what is the most likely diagnosis um, and passing the cover test. So a slightly longer clinical scenario here, um, but the sufficient information. Um, this lady presented with steadiness. It was recent. She's been given IV gentamicin, um, sensory neuro hearing loss, and bilateral impaired stimulant reflex. And so, I would hope that you would avoid uh, gentamicin toxicity given the information in the video. And so, in writing good SBAs, there are some there are some errors that we want to avoid. Um, this one is a logical error. I'll let you all read it just for a second. Um, this man is admitted to hospital after seeing a seizure, kept nil by mouth because of his drowsiness. And what's the most appropriate treatment to prescribe um, for this patient? And so the logical error here is he's nil by mouth. So options C and D become irrelevant, and the strategic student is now down to guessing three instead of five options. So uh, it's just a, a, a scenario where language and, and the focus of the question is quite important. Um, this lady has had a second episode of pelvic artery disease. The likelihood of this woman being infertile is, um, again, this is a numerical flaw. So you've got less than 20 percent. 20 to 30 percent, greater than 50 percent, 90 percent, and, and 75 percent. So, not very logically numerical values. There's overlap. Um, so less, than, you know, greater than 50. Option D and, and E both apply. So if you're going to use numbers, it's again incredibly important to be numerically homogeneous. And, and if you really want to ask about risks and, and, uh, and include numbers, it, it should be an important um, question. And we typically like to avoid the use of certain types of language, including never and always and often. And so in, in avoiding the type of language, we can be uh, more explicit. So are we never going to use exercise, ice, NSAIDs, paracetamol, physiotherapy. The, the most likely is always an opportunity where something might might be the, the, uh, the one that gets away. So avoid using language that never, always, often, um, try to be explicit. And this, I think this is the last, the last um, poor example I have, which is, um, Again, I'm a strategic student. I didn't go to class when we were looking at all of these 
investigations and what do I do next? So, do I call for help? Well, yes. If I didn't know what to do, I would call for help. But I could give IV access, supplemental oxygen, see, I could investigate uh, for an abdominal complication, resuscitate the IVs, and give oxygen or painkillers. And so the strategic student um, would look at option D and say, well, there's an awful lot of things in the, in the option, so I, I'll, I'll go for that one because it clearly covers the rest. So, um, again, um, a tip to avoid the, the long, um, correct answer, um, which covers uh, a range of different options. And so here we have an example of uh, a question that, that on the face looks, looks quite all right. Um, this lady is a 30-year-old criminal gravida, 39 weeks, immediately recognized she's having a plant procedure. After securing her airway, um, the first step in management should be IV administration of. And option B is immediate delivery, so that's not an IV administration. Um, a CT scan is not an IV administration. So in, in improving a question like this, it could, it could just be what is the first step in, in her management. Um, if you have a list of somewhat um, less homogeneous options. So if you do with a little bit of work, it, it's, it's almost there. <coughs> and in just wrapping up some of the errors and build, rule, golden rules or golden standards for SDA, um, I'd say the, the, the best approach is to apply the cover test. It ensures that your question is focused and clear. And you should have homogeneous options and avoid the long correct answer. Um, avoid giving the answer in the scenario, which is sometimes creative. So we avoid negative language like um, what is the least correct or what is the most unlikely. Um, this leads to confusion amongst um, a learner. If you're asking a negative question, the learner has to go to the positive first and rule that all out and then turn everything upside down and go to negative. The scenario um, <coughs> may, be, may be long, but bear in mind the length of your assessment. And the lead-in must be really clear. You're asking a clear question with um, homogeneous options and avoid the long correct option. And it's very important to review your items, and this is a good quality assurance approach. Um, it's good to, I think, if you're starting to write uh, exam questions, to write with a group and review in a group. Uh, more, more than two pairs of eyes is always good. Um, and in summary for the first part of this, I know I've focused on single best answer questions and the um, title of this workshop is the death of the MCQ. So, whilst it would favour a good single best answer question that can test knowledge and best skill application of knowledge, um, they, focus, they can focus on clear and important concepts, clinical reasoning, diagnosis, <coughs> management, um, basic sciences. Um, they're good if they're clear, they allow for efficient sampling of knowledge across your curriculum and can be machine readable. But, in terms of flogging the MCQ, um, a very well written single best answer can easily be converted into a very short answer question. Um, and so I'm going to go back to uh, what I thought was a good SDA initially. And again, we've, we're back to the 32 year old man, I showed you this earlier. Um, <coughs> upper respiratory tract infection, temperature, based on my age, blood pressure. 1,080, etc. What's the most likely diagnosis? So I've removed the options. There should be sufficient information in the scenario for this to be a good um, BSA. So with that, um, I hope that I can flog the MCQ and we have rebirthed the BSA and I'll hand over to Amir. <laughs>
Amazing. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, Claire's already covered most of this, but is there anything else you can think in terms of on the left, the SDAs? Any other advantages? Perhaps I could become the president of the European Board of Medical Assessors, Professor Freeman. Can you give us a few good things about SDAs? Um, uh, students are familiar with the... Uh, Familiarity. So we, we know the instrument, the students know it, so that's important. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, um, I guess I know that uh, all the schools here are TBL schools, so you do the TBL process and the team test and you get feedback, you really do need to see the best answer. So if you want to do that step, then I think you do need the best answer. I think, but I don't know. Absolutely, that's a good point. We'll come back to that. You can get very good um, performance data and psychometric statistical performance data. Absolutely, I don't have any kind from the others. Exactly, so we, we know the point by serial, the facility, all the things we get for SBAs. Can we get similar uh, psychometric measures for the other types? Mm -hmm. Lots of banks of questions. But we, have, we have banks, and that's, <laughs> that's, that's an important point. We've got banks that we've built, and, it's, and Medical Schools Council has taken us about five years to get to about 3,000 questions, which is still not big. So, um, what do we do with the banks? Absolutely, as resources. Um, for the student size, so they need to know what is right, and the state line, what is strong, what is strong. Absolutely, so they're a very good learning resource because if you've got an SBA in front of you, you learn about the five options that one is correct, one is incorrect, and there's a good explanation, justification why the other four are not right. That's a good learning resource. <coughs> good. Absolutely. So, in terms of institutions, obviously they are reliable on the left, so the SBAs are reliable. They are machine marked efficiently. They assess recognition. But as Claire's already mentioned, they're subject to a lot of queuing. Uh, and often coming up with plausible distractors may not be that easy. So we end up not testing many things because we can't think of four wrong things. And therefore we say, well, let's not test them. And that leads to a lack of assessment of some core topics. And if you're not assessing it, people won't be learning. Open ended, on the other hand, they assess rec generation knowledge rather than recognition. You can test core knowledge, but they aren't resource intensive in terms of marking. The other problem is that the MCQs promote the students to learn the exam technique. So there's a lot of learning going on about learning how to answer the MCQ rather than the construct <coughs> that we are hoping to assess at the expense of deep learning. So um, that's a problem. There is also some data that there is less long term retention assess uh, associated with MCQs. So if you learn something through MCQs, although you look at the four incorrect options, if you then go back to it, you have retained less as opposed to when you would have answered something as an MCQ. Yes? How, how um, just comparing the short answer with uh, my problem of choice, how big is that effect? Is it a big effect, a small effect? Is it sort of, you know, worth the effort or, or not? Um, there isn't enough data to answer that question. So we know, for example, there are some studies looking at you know, a few months down the line. Sure. If you answer something as an SAQ, the students still retain it. But it's yeah. difficult to extrapolate. Absolutely. So is it worth it? Because we don't really know yet. Exactly. Okay. So this is when it all began. So we, term, we coined the term the VSA. Uh, when I was teaching a group of our year three students, and I gave them 15 questions. So you can see each question here is on a different topic. Okay. And the white is the number of the students who got the answer correct in the BSA format, in other words, they had to say what the diagnosis was. And the black is the number of students who got the same question correct when, I, when we gave it to them as an MCQ or an SCA. And I want to draw your attention to question nine, which is particularly close to my heart. So this is somebody who's sick in AD. They've got high blood glucose, they're acidotic, they're sick, and we think this is diabetic ketoacidosis. You know the diabetes, you know the acidosis. All they have to say is what would they measure next ketones because that influences the management of the patient. And only 42 of our students could say the word ketone. Okay? These are only year three students, by the way. First year, we're seeing patients in hospital. Probably long attachments. On the other hand, when I ask the same question five minutes later, we're giving them the options, another 165 students suddenly can say ketone. Now that's a problem, because we would have thought that 200 and something, you know, almost everybody knows that they should be measuring ketones, that's what we believe. But actually, if they were faced with that patient in AM, only 42 people would have asked for the ketone. 
The problem is that the patient will not say, Doctor, are you going to measure A, my lactate, B, my CRP, C, my ketones? You just have to do it. And I've shown this as many, I've, I've presented this data in about 14 countries now. Nobody has yet stood up to say, we don't expect people to say ketones, because this is the thing they have to do. Doug? I might expect a year five student to be able to say ketones, but I'd be happy if a year three student could pick it from a range of options. Absolutely. The, the issue is that the same problem persists in year six and with the registrars as well. So that was the frightening thing. We then said, is this a year three thing? Do it in year four, five, six, not four, five, six. <laughs> Uh, and then the problem persists. And I'll show you some more data. Just uh, well, the question is so that test form is randomized in the order because if you have taken the test with a short of the form and then you redo the test after five minutes, you might get a better result just because you have already answered the question. Exactly so you right. You're going in a randomized order. And, and that's when we came to the random order. <laughs> <laughs> So we thought, this is it. We have randomized prospective studies in that. So why not have randomized prospective studies properly in education? So we got ethical approval, 300 students. We randomized them into doing 60 SBAs. They had the STEM, as the parents already showed you, uh, the lead in the question and the options, 60 minutes. And then we did exactly the same using 60 DSAs, which were identical questions, just that the options were now the same. And we delivered this using uh, practic uh, at Imperial. Uh, and we gave them 90 minutes, because initially we thought you need a bit more time to write the answer. So this is a design of the study. First, the group one had the ESAs, 155 students randomized to see the 60 ESAs. Then they went on to see the SBAs. In group two, they were randomized to see the SBAs first, and then the DSA, and see what happens. So here's an example. On the left-hand side, you've got a 24-year-old woman who's got lethargy, malaise, dizziness, she's got low sodium, high potassium. What's the most likely diagnosis? Addison's disease out of five. So they have to pick Addison's from a list of five options. On the right hand side, the blue BSA is an identical question. This time, what's the most likely diagnosis with no answers? They have to write it. And the machine will know to give the correct, hand, correct mark to the following options that we thought the students would offer. Okay, and it took us some while to work with um, Fry IT to develop the software that would recognize the correct answers. So the machine would see Addison's disease, you get a mark. If you say primary immune insufficiency, you get a mark. If you say Addison's disease, the amber, it's a non-exact match. The machine says, well, it looks very much similar to what you want, but it isn't exactly the same. Would you want to give it a mark? And then you can say yes or no. It's already given it a mark. And the examiner will then have to look at the, the red to see, is there anything in the red that you haven't anticipated? So primary hyperadrenalism is correct, but we have anticipated. So then we need to overwrite uh, and give it the mark, which we have, as you, as you can see next to it, there is one mark. So two examiners reviewed, and to our amazement, it took us on average 1 minute 36 seconds to go through the red, because you've already got rid of a whole load of other correct and incorrect things, and you just have to focus on the remaining options. So that was pretty um, efficient to, to mark. Now, the beauty of this is that actually, you can, the system will then remember. You might argue the first time around, you might get a whole range of incorrect answers, uh, the correct answers that you had anticipated, but the machine will remember them next time around. So for example, if the answer is ultrasound of the left leg, and some people write left leg ultrasound, there's many variations of writing the same thing. The machine will remember, this is where Machine learning, if you like, comes into place where you remember this for next time round. So next time you actually um, run the same question, administer it, administer it you will um, have it marked much quicker and efficiently. So, what did we learn? Group 1 took 78 minutes to answer the VSAs. Group 2 only took 26 minutes to answer the VSAs. Why? What happened in group two? Why did it take so much less to answer the same questions in group two? Queued. Yeah, because they had already seen the SBA, they already, I mean the queuing still persisted mm -hmm. two hours down the line. They still remembered the answer, so they weren't thinking uh, as much as the first groups. It took them a lot less. So in order to show, I mean we, we didn't set out to show that the VSAs were more reliable. What we wanted to show is that they are efficient, they're acceptable, and they're a good instrument to test the things that we aren't testing with SBS. But in order to provide the evidence, 
we have to show a non-inferiority. We have to show they're not worse than SPX. So we have to look at all the psychometrics, and this is where Doug's question uh, arises. So reliability, combat alpha, VSX 0.91, SPX 0.84. VSX 0.84. So if anything, the reliability of the VSAs was high. But is this, is this statistically significant, or is this just random noise? We then went on to the item response theory. And in classical test theory, we have one measure of reliability. We say the Cronbach alpha of this test is 0.84. That's the measure of consistency of the test. However, the reliability of the test is not consistent across the ability spectrum. It's not one thing. So on the x-axis here, we have the ability shown in theta, um, 0 to 0.4 to 4 plus. This is a very, very good candidate. And minus 4 is the weak, weakest candidate. And you can see that the ability Vary, um, the reliability of your test varies across the ability spectrum. It's not one, it's not one figure, as we are led to believe in class, classical test theory. So here are the four groups. The top two, the red and the purple, are the VSAs. The red is the VSAs when they haven't seen the SBA. The purple is the group that saw the VSA after they saw the SBA. And the green and the blue are the SBA groups. So what do you notice? What do you conclude about the reliability of the VSAs? It's higher across the ability spectrum, which was an amazing finding for us. So the reliability of the VSAs was significantly higher than the SBAs across the ability spectrum with a large effect size, a covalency of 1.747 to 0.73, which is quite a decent effect size. So here's some data for those who want some hardcore um, IRT sensors. It's a person precision, 0.98 for the VSA group 1, 0.97 for the VSA in group 2. Um, we then submitted the data to the medical education and said, this is fascinating, but that's a one parameter. So in IRT, you have one parameter that's difficult. What happens if you look at the three parameter logistic model when you bring in the guessing and, and discrimination? And again, if I, commit, if I can convince you, the purple and blue is the standard error measurement for the VSAs and the red and the green is the SEM for the SCAs. And you can see that there is lower standard error measurement associated with the, um, with the BSA. So we submitted this work to medical education, uh, and they came back with the proofs all in black and white, because medical education is a black and white thing. <laughs> so hang on a minute, I spent years, <laughs> years trying to construct it. It just looked like a, a block, you know, just black. So we then, I then emailed to, um, the puppy, the, the, the editor saying, this is, this is amazing, but nobody can tell anything for it. It's just black and white. They all look the same. <laughs> and they said, well, we can add a thing at the bottom saying um, correction and then change the tone, the semitones. By which point, somebody in Maastricht, one of our collaborators, said, hang on, so correction is the stepdaughter of retraction. We don't want the word correction. There's nothing to correct. There's no mistake. It's just a change. So I had to basically um, have a lot of correspondence with the publishers, and eventually they gave up saying, this guy never gives up, we have to change the semitones to get him off our back. So they, 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 they use a different semitone, it's now published in the medical education, in a way that you can actually uh, appreciate the difference between the points. Now, I want to show you some data on item characteristics, but in, in case you're not, you're not familiar with ICCs, you do some mathematical modeling to look at the probability of getting a correct answer across the ability spectrum. So if you're a weak candidate, the probability of getting a correct answer is zero. And if you're a very strong candidate, the probability of getting the answer correct is one. Does that make sense? Okay. The slope of this curve is the discrimination of your question. So the deeper the slope, the bigger the discrimination. And this asymptote, the lower asymptote, is the guessing. So for this particular question, the lower asymptote is zero. That means the probability of getting this question for somebody who is very weak is zero. But what would you expect the lower asymptote to be in an SBA with five options? Is it zero? No. No. What is it? About 0.2. So this will never be zero in an SBA, because even if you know nothing by guess, <laughs> it's just like 0.2. Okay. So let me show you some data. Huh beautiful data on item characteristics. So these are our 60 SBAs. Now look at the level of guessing associated <laughs> with SBAs. There are some questions that the asymptote is close to one. Mm. This is people answering these questions with no knowledge whatsoever mm. of the topic. Does that reassure you? Is it 
give you confidence. This is a VSA. Obviously, this is mathematical modeling, so it's not sample dependent. Okay, you're doing many, many iterations. But I could convince you that it's a much cleaner picture. There's less guessing associated with the VSAs uh, into the set. Now, what happens in the VSAs in the second group? There's a lot of guessing. Again, what happens here? They've seen the SBAs before. So now they're doing a lot more guessing here because they're cheated. Because they saw the same questions in the, in the SBA format before they answered the VSA. Now, if you are not fond of either character scales, here are some real data for you. So in 20% of questions, more than a third of students only answered the SBA correctly. In other words, they had no idea what the diagnosis or the management was, but they got it right. More than a third of students in more than 20% of questions. There is also negative queuing, 3.5%. What does that mean? That's somebody who gave the correct answer in the VSA format. They knew what the diagnosis was, or what the management was, but they got the SBA wrong, because they thought there's some sort of trick in the question. So somebody who actually knows what they should do, but they get the SBA, that's also not right. The negative queuing, if anything, is actually more worrying, because they know the answer, but they're getting it wrong in the SBA. That's great. If you go back to the benchmark answer, you have four correct alternatives. But in the single back answer, the only one, we add some disease. Oh, they are all the same thing. They're variations of saying the same thing. Yeah, but yeah, but still, one student might have answered, mm -hmm. not have used the term Addison's disease on the ESA. Then when you do the single back, then you see Addison. Since you didn't answer that on the ESA, you would probably not choose it. So this is, a, there is a bias because we have more options. Yes. Correct. And again, you would argue that you shouldn't be disadvantaging students to know what they should be saying because you're not using the same terminology. You're actually disadvantaging them because in real life, you wouldn't care if they said anisols or adrenal insufficiency mm -hmm. or primary mm -hmm. hub. Exactly. I mean, but that could also explain why you answer wrong. And when you do this, Yes. And um, again, for those who want a bit more hardcore, um, Psychometrics, here is the um, Cohen's D effect, so this is the mean latent score, and you can see the difference of the Cohen's D effect in the group 1 was 0.4 in group 2.14. So again, what's happened here? Why is there a less of an effect size in group 2 compared to group 1 between the SBA and BSA? <coughs> the same thing, because the queuing effect, they've seen the SBA questions, and therefore the mean latent scores between the SBA and BSA are closer uh, in group 2. When I'm showing these clinicians, they say, we don't care that, about those numbers, I to practice to curves. Show us some real data. And this is some real data. You, the patient's presented with this rash. Only 13% know what the rash is. You give it to them as five options, and then about 70% of them say it's erythema multiform. Again, the patient will not come to you to say, doctor, do you think I have A, erythema nodosum, <laughs> B, erythema multiform, and C, erythema arginatum? You'll have to make a diagnosis. So, um, this is some more tangible data. Going on to discrimination, um, so uh, first of all, we've asked about data that we could use to uh, look at the, the psychometrics of the questions. The mean point by serial, the high total, uh, high total uh, score is used as a measure of discrimination. Uh, it was actually, to our amazement, higher in the VSA. So we didn't set out to show that they were more discriminatory, more reliable, but the VSA turned out to be more uh, discriminatory. Similarly, the item Theta score is the IRT correlate of um, quantified serial, and again, that was significantly higher. So VSA is more discriminatory. And this is why this has gained a lot of traction and momentum in the UK, because all the psychometricians are now behind this. We've been saying for some time, this is common sense. You don't need all these numbers to prove that there is a lot of guessing associated with SBA. There was a whole body of literature around this for years. So when I started talking to Case Lander Luton, he said, you know, SBA is good, good construct, SBAs have a value, which we both agreed. When then increasingly the data came out, people started realizing that actually you can have VSAs that are more discriminatory, more reliable, uh, and, and actually more authentic, because that's what happens in real life. Patients don't give you five options. The other thing that was very interesting is actually when we ran VSAs, so you could say actually that SBAs is what you use in your medical school. But if you want to generate good SBAs, you could run them as VSAs to see what people give you. And you'll be amazed that with the, when they answer the questions, you will come up with distractors that you didn't even think about. 
So we had, on average, two distractors that the students get that weren't in the five options that we thought people could generate, which was amazing. <laughs> on the other hand, on average, up to three distractors were never used. So you come up as faculty with an SBA, single best answer, which is the current gold, pack, gold standard, five options, and you suddenly discover actually people are giving two new ones which you never thought about, and they're never using three that you gave them. So I would encourage running SBA if you're writing SPAs, run them as DSAs and actually generate more uh, better distractors for your SPA. Now, we come on to this thorny issue of standard setting. How are we going to standard set? Um, so, in order to address the question, I thought, okay, let's get two panels and make sure that they are equivalent. So, I gave them an, S2, uh, an SPA paper, so this is panel one, consisting of 10 experienced faculty members and some junior doctors to have a well balanced group. And I asked them to stand and set the paper, and we use all the accepted methods. We use angle, evil, we also use Hofstede and, and, and Cohen. Uh, what can you tell from the, the data? The two groups. Can I say to you that panel one and panel two are two equivalent groups of people? Yes? Is everyone happy to say panel one and panel two are reasonably equivalent? Would that be happy? So then I give them the BSA paper, and then the panel two gets the SBA paper, and they give me the passport. Does that surprise you? So group, so they are setting, what do you use in LKC angle for evil? Evil. So the BSA pass mark is 58.4. The SBA question, they're the same question, which is one of the SBSA, one of the SBA. The cut score is 57. Is that Acceptable? Do you think that's acceptable? Do you think that's so uh, great? Great. Do you think it's okay? Yeah? So, what happens? If you then set the cut score, this is the distribution of BSA marks, and these are SBA marks. What happens to the people <laughs> taking the BSA? Most people fail, for example. Okay? So if you use the same password for the BSA SBA, most people will fail. So my question for you is, since this is a workshop, I, I'd, I'd be interested to know, is this the correct line and therefore these people have to fail? Or actually, now going back, you want to revise what you said a minute ago, and it's not right. You have to go back and say, this isn't, this isn't a great password. So yeah, yeah, will, will the examiners give you the answer? Or do they have to work out the answer themselves? They have the answer in both cases. They just one had the five options and one didn't, but they had the correct answer. So the answer is to use the Cohen, which everyone hates. To use the Cohen that people object to. Cohen, yes. So what happens? <laughs> in Cohen's, you have no problem in terms of the, uh, the past state, absolutely. So the students are the best judge of how uh, the student performance is the best judge of how the students perform. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, we have several deeds and heads of medical schools here. And it's very after our heads. So if we went to <coughs> Naomi or or Martin or, um, or Adrian, and he said, actually, we've now failed 80% of the year. <laughs> they wouldn't be very happy with the same okay. So, what do we do? But, Amit, you're, you're using norm referencing <laughs> with the Cohen. No, forget about the Cohen. We now have, let's say, that we <laughs> said, we've got a problem. We've got a problem with, forget, forget the Cohen. We've got the um, e -ball. the panel. You, you said that you were happy with the construction pattern. They're equivalent panels. They're Sorry, I, I didn't. I said it was crazy. But uh, that's because I've heard you talk before. But um, <laughs> it, it kind of comes back to Claire's point. It, any assessment, and then indeed any panel, you've got to say, what's the purpose of this assessment? And so we went back to the panel, and we said, I'm sure that this is what you want to do. And the first response was, well, you're asking me in the evil how difficult I think this is. The difficulty of a question where they have to say ketones for diabetic ketones, this is, I think, this medium. How important this is, we think this is essential. How, is that, how should that influence my, uh, my answer? You go to the angle of the panel and you say, are you really sure you want to give 50 and I say, well, you're asking me what proportion of just past candidates should get this right or would get this right, whether you're a would or a should person. Well, I think 60% of a just pass candidate would get this wrong. Well, 
But we have to recognize that people find this much more difficult. And this isn't what we've done before, and this is a new paradigm. So for me, this is the most important thing. We could adjust using Cohen or, or, or training our panel to recognize that they have to set a lower password with an evil angle, etc., which we have done since. 80% said the DSAs are easier. 70% said they are more representative real life, what they would be asked to do in clinical practice. But most importantly, half of them owned up that if this is what um, the medical school decides is the form of assessment, we have to spend more time in clinical environments because we have to see what is done in AE to be able to say key terms. We can no longer spend time learning how to practice exam technique. So I don't know, I don't, that's what the faculty may say the behaviour should be, but it won't. It will drive the students into finding more and more sources to practice those um, questions. But how would you practice a question which has got they, no they nothing? Still, they will still go. And they, they will still. Will still, like, they, will still they, the, they will go to the library to try and find out every find out every possible answer and, and cram their their knowledge. <laughs> And so it'll have it will be completely the opposite. We already struggle with students wanting to practice uh, their OSCEs uh, you know, in, in, in a room like this rather than in clinical place. True. So that remains to be determined. And we need to study, you know, we need to study to what extent uh, that, will, that will turn out to be true. Yes. So we uh, look at the assessment as a learning tool. So is this assessment tool a good learning tool? So if it's a good learning tool, then if students go and learn and try to find out every different option, I guess, um, is that not we, what we want? <laughs> I'm going to turn it around because, you know, I think you mentioned in your first uh, presentation on programmatic assessment that assessment is a learning tool. So is the BSA a good learning tool? That would be my question back to you. I mean, this remains to be... This is what our grant is going to do. Yeah, so this is, this is the subject of further research. I'll tell you about it um, in a minute. Absolutely. So those are both really good questions. Will it drive people to a different sort of learning behaviour that we're not yet aware of? But isn't the question you're asking that uh, we have to be much clearer about the facts that we think students must know because we want to test them to know those facts? Or are we content to teach them lots of facts and to live with the facts that they will only recall a certain amount of that fact. I mean, is, which, which is how ready, which, yeah, how ready, what do they need to know at the point of graduation correct. to be effective? So it may well be that if we test them with BSA at the point of graduation, we will only test a really small amount of fact which they absolutely must know, rather than giving huge masses of fact where they, we know that using the system that we test them with, they will generally pass at reasonably high school. Well, which will we're talking about point of graduation, which would then prepare them best to be doctors a few years down the line. Good question. If you said, learn this, that's all you need to know to, to graduate, versus there's a wealth of knowledge, you're going to have to learn which parts of this knowledge you learn at which point in your career. To be, to be discussed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's taken us nicely to this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I promise you that wasn't a question that we would mark at this point. No, it's, it's essentially difficult to find four plausible correct answers. Four pl plausible, because remember, they're not single correct answers, they are single best answers. So the other four are plausible things. And that's why we resort to, I mean, if you look at the National Bank, there's lots of questions on there are topics that we would assume they're not core topics because they're much more easy to write for distractors for and you end up not asking things that we think are really important that you can't write distractors for. Yes. Also, there might be more than one correct answer in managing equations. So we had a question on, on, on ar arrhythmia and since we had given, I can't remember, amiodron and somebody said magnesium and vice versa. And to a cardiologist, both were acceptable but we were not rewarding that student with the mark they deserved because they gave it an equally plausible correct answer. The other problem that I have with SBA is that we end up fiddling a lot with the scenario to make sure that the other four are, are, are plausible. So it, by the time it finishes, it no longer is the, the history of the patient. We're not using a, a real history to see what is the answer. We keep fiddling with it. We increase the temperature a little bit. We give them a slightly higher CRP. We give them a little bit of a low hemoglobin so that the other four are not totally wrong. And again, that's contrived. 
And should we have, is, is life a zero and one, or would some answers merit a 0 0.5, 0 0.2, or 0 0.6? And some people feel very strongly. Some say, you know, you can't half treat your patients. Others say, actually, if you take a, if this particular step, you're halfway there, and therefore that merits a 0 0.5 um, point. Um, now, the thing that is, to me was really amazing with VSAs that we can't do with SBAs is there are a range of incorrect responses that we receive. We don't see what are they thinking. All the answers that they offer, which is not in the five options, gives us an enormously powerful tool to give them feedback and get insight into the students' thinking. And that can help you improve and evaluate your curriculum. In other words, if you suddenly discover that a whole lot of people are giving a, a disease that is not on your file in, in the list that you give given in the VSA, in the SBA format. You think, what, what is it that they're thinking about? Why are they thinking that particular diagnosis? So in summary, the first part of the presentation, we published this in earlier this year to report that the VSA questions were more reliable to screen treatment associated with no queuing, but they are more authentic um, and valid in collaboration with um, colleagues in Australia. So, we then thought, could we use VSAs to assess prescribing? And we ran essentially a similar um, study using prescribing VSAs, again, um, in collaboration with um, colleagues in from IIT to develop, to, to extend the tool so that we could now mark prescribing uh, VSAs. The reason we did that is currently we have a deficiency in assessing prescribing. If you're using SBAs, again, the, the tool is not fit for purpose because the patient doesn't give you a list of five prescriptions and doctor choose one. You have to actually write the prescription. And if you tell me that you use prescribing, you assess prescribing in the OSCE station, I would challenge that and say, well, do you have only one, two stations in the OSCE? How many prescribing questions can you ask in your OSCE station? So we have a problem uh, with prescribing. Does anybody else here use any other ways of sampling the prescribing? Um, syllabus effectively, apart from what do we use? What do other people use? Well, it's, uh, we have an SBA. Anyway, we, we, we build it into SBA, and if you do print it for the year, it may appear in our school. But this is something that for the formative part, is literally two pharmacists with uh, one of the clinicians looking at the scripts written by the student, by either school. electronically or the paper. <coughs> So, so we, we then get, did exactly the same thing. We gave them VSAs, SBAs with full access to the BNF. And this is the result, okay? So, it took us an average in the first iterations to mark each um, question for the whole cohort three minutes. We've now reduced it to about one minute with further iteration of the tools we've developed. And this is the correlation between the SBA and the VSA mark. Now, can I draw your attention to this particular group of students? Very few, but they are getting 60% on the VSA, which is the pass bar and zero on the VSA. 60 on the SBA pass, they're not able to write a single prescription. Okay? The mark on the VSA is zero versus 60%. Does that not scale? Okay? There is someone who cannot write a single prescription but is able to get 60% on the SBA test because they spot the correct prescription. The average mark on the prescription VSA is about 25%. 60% for the SBA. Now that's scary. We thought, is this really a year three thing? So Douglas said, this is a year three. We thought we could move on and do the same year six, but now extended beyond Imperials. We thought we collaborate with Edinburgh, another very good medical school. Um, just to show you the range of the incorrect answers, so about 60% are getting the incorrect drug, 10% are getting the right drug with the incorrect dose, 7% are getting the incorrect frequency. Would you give a mark? or half a mark to somebody who gave the correct drug for the wrong dose. So for reason I would rather than 40, I would prescribe 400. <laughs> Do you think they merit half a mark? So we gave zero because we thought you can't actually give the right drug with the wrong dose the wrong frequency. Some people say you should have given half a mark. We thought actually you can't give the wrong dose because you'll kill the patient. So they got zero. So we then went on to develop... Sorry, do you expect them to be able to know the dose apart from an emergency treatment? Those are access to the DNA. So they have thought they can just go to the DNA. Okay, okay. This is the online DNA. <laughs> <laughs> and just copy-paste. So I said, don't, worry, don't even worry about the spelling. Just, if you know, they just copy-paste it into the box. Uh, we then spent a lot of time over the last six to eight months developing the tool where the students could put in uh, the drug name, the dose, the unit, the root, the frequency, with auto-complete fields if they put PO, the system would recognize it's oral if they put IM, the system would understand it's intramuscular. 
Uh, and we have now refined it, so you can mark, we managed to mark the entire uh, prescriptions for Imperial and Edinburgh students. For, uh, in, in each prescription was marked in, in about a minute, under a minute. So we marked about 500 students, 500 prescriptions in less than a minute, which is pretty efficient. Um, some students were arguing, so this is, my, this is one of my slides at the beginning of the session with students saying, you might think that actually currently you don't actually prescribe, you, 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 you choose it from a list, but try choosing sodium chloride in a list, a drop down menu, this is what the, the system gives you. You still need to know what you want to prescribe, okay? You still need to know these normal state lines, one liter, et etc. You still need to put in the root frequency. We use the CERNA uh, sort of fields to, uh, as part of developing our prescribing tool. Now, I, I will just give you some uh, examples. So this is a, a new diabetic where you have to prescribe. Um, you can see that a lot of people are giving various prescriptions that are all marked automatically correct in metformin 500 milligrams. If you just write metformin dot dot dot, no dose, no frequency, obviously you're not getting any, uh, any marks. Okay, now, this is a hypertensive patient needing fluid. Okay, data from two of the best medical schools in the UK. Look at what people are prescribing. Sodium chloride one liter over eight hours. Mm -hmm. This patient will be dead if you run that normal straight line over eight hours. One sodium, what does that mean? Cephalexin, citrofloxin, cyclism. <laughs> this one, fluids, 500 milliliters a day thing. There is a thing called fluids, 500 milliliters prescribed. It might sound ludicrous to begin with, but I thought actually no, because every time they've revised for an SBA, the answer is fluids intravenous. The SBA doesn't doesn't um, really ask what sort of fluid. Generally, it's a, you, can't, you could have SPAs that have fluids in it, but this is what they've learned. So they think there is a drug called fluids. Something there is a drug called fluids in ACL. Fruzamide, they don't get on someone's diabetes. Loperamide, metoclopramide. I would have never known that people would have wanted to give these things to a hypertensive patient in AU. And that is a really powerful tool to prevent errors. So we've just written with uh, Martin and other uh, colleagues a uh, paper about to submit to say, actually, this is a really powerful tool for preventing errors that kill how many people a month? Is that, is that about 800 people done? About that. About that in the UK of prescription errors. And, and this is a way of actually knowing before people go out on the wards to make these mistakes. Say, hang on a minute. You shouldn't be giving fruitsamide in this particular scenario. Uh, this is another a patient with hyposmolar hyperglycemic state bulk. Um, treatment is fluids. Um, four people. It's a bit scary. This particular one um, I found absolutely amazing. Somebody wants to get 100 units of insulin out of a patient. What would happen to this patient? If they will die. Okay? They will die. Why do you think they want to prescribe 100 units of acrapin? <coughs> They've never seen insulin being prescribed. They've never seen? But why 100? I mean, we would have never, you would never give an SBA option that says 100 units of, of ACRA. You just don't think such a thing is possible. It is possible because people are dying from it. It is possible. It happens. The reason is they open the BNF or they look online and it says 100 units is the concentration. <laughs> so they think you prescribe the concentration. Awesome. Okay? And again, it's given the insight into you could be prescribing. 50 times a dose, I mean the correct answer to this was 2 to 4 units. They're prescribing 100 units because that's the thing they see in DNF, and if they're not experienced, uh, no one's actually taught them. So this is really powerful in terms of giving us feedback. What are we doing now? We are uh, doing a study across 20 medical schools in the UK, so 20 schools are using ESAs, the same question. So on the first Saturday, 1st of December, I'll be in Chagrin building marking scripts from over hopefully 2,000 um, students. Uh, we'll see how long it will take uh, to mark in terms of utility. So I'm going to report back uh, to you saying how long will it take if this was done on a national scale and we ran um, this on medical schools including Manchester. I don't know, is Exeter taking part? They're doing it this week. Yeah. They're doing it this week, amazing. Um, the other thing we're doing is actually a think aloud study. So we selected five medical schools, again, including Manchester, Imperial, Cambridge, Leicester and Warwick. We visited and I spent some time with the students uh, about a week ago to go through the cognitive processes. So what happens in their mind when they actually reach the answer? 
and it was absolutely fascinating. So I had a, a, a student in one of these notes was incredibly bright, and I gave them the, uh, the BSA versions, and we've collected and we've randomized these questions so carefully so that various people see the various forms of the SBAs and BSAs. And this student, incredibly bright, read the question said, there is backache, there is anemia, there is high calcium, uh, there is impaired renal function. This sounds like myeloma. So I would like to do some sort of imaging. And then about that, so she's talking now, and we're recording this, and I'm the facilitator. And about an hour later, um, I give them the SBAs, looks at the same question, I said, I think, tell me the steps you thought through in answering the SBA. And he went exactly through the same question and said, I'd like to see a pro protein electrophoresis, which was the correct answer from the SBA. I said, hang on a minute. You said imaging before. That was well, I did, but now I see the options. I've changed my mind. The issue is in real life, the patient will not give you, even if you have the same thought process, you will not be given the list of options. So there's a lot of learning from, uh, from the thing last time. I want to finally finish by saying, is this sufficient in summary? Because all I've told you about is, in, is informative assessment. And there is a difference between informative. So informative are low stakes, summative are high stakes. Informative, there is selection bias. So who actually takes part in the study? In summative, everybody has to take part in the study. It's not optional. There is no past day informatives, but you have to pass the summative to progress. There is no ranking associated with formatives. Sadly, uh, our exams, some of them contribute to ranking. Students may not be as motivated as formative. You could have said, well, they didn't really care about giving you the correct answer because it doesn't count. What will happen if they are? They really have to give you the correct answer. Uh, and there is little or no preparation for formatives. You could argue that they will have to be at the peak of their, of their preparedness uh, for a summative. So we tried this in pathology, which allows us to test this in a wide range of topics. Uh, before we did it, I thought, okay, let's do this like a proof of concept on paper. It's going to be painful. People will be asking me, how efficient is this? So we ran a, a, a VSA on paper. You will not believe this, but we actually set 25 questions. We said, we'll do it by hand as a proof of concept. Uh, we stand as if it an evil. And it took us, uh, for the 21 hours of 380, students and very efficient marking part as we call it. So for 50 SCAs it would have taken 84 hours. Is 84 hours an acceptable amount of marking for one single exam? No. 84 hours is far too long for one paper. If I start doing that, uh, Martin will not uh, be very happy. So we're going to spend 84 hours for every single exam marking. We then this year, June 2018, ran a pathology uh, exam with 50 SDAs, 50 EMQs, and 50 DSAs delivered on practice from Friday. Uh, we, we did standard setting using EBL. To give you an example, so if they said acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that's an exact match, 92 people automatically marked. You don't need to look at the scripts. If they say acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the examiner gave them a mark because that's also a valid answer. And there are variations of the spelling, and we were less particular about spelling in pathology. This is not like prescribing, so if there is a, if there's a mis spelling mistake, there is a little bit wrong. This was 14 times more efficient. Okay, So we had the pathology exam in the morning. Everything was marked by 5 p.m. the same day. All results known. So 14 times more efficient than the paper version. You could have your results the same day. So in summary, I would say that the MCQ, the SBA, definitely has a place for learning for exams because that's what we know, that's what we have done for many years, we've got good data on it. But the VSAs will give you a new dimension into testing core knowledge. So we have gone for a provocative type of killing the MCQs. The MCQ still has a place in many, many exams. But I think VSAs are, and, and Increasingly, people are saying that we will use DSAs in our assessments to test for core knowledge for things that we can't assess, for example, for uh, risk um, I'd like to thank our collaborators in behind our script and also uh, various collaborators, uh, Val Walsh, Colin Melbourne from the GMC, Ray Hussle from Leicester, Sina Taylor from Warwick, PT Exelon from Kiel. Uh, this work has generated a lot of um, you know, collaborations within the UK and we're hoping to extend this. And in fact, we're just about to look your collaboration with LKC and submitting for answer. Thank you, Thank you very much. I mean, did you get any data looking specifically at um, to, uh, improving the SBA through your uh, 
uh, through your very short answer sort of format. So in other words, you've got better distractors perhaps, and you planted it back into your SBAs and improved the psychometric properties of the SBA. So that's a very good question. We could do that, absolutely. We could then go using the distractors given by the students. That's right. My suspicion would be the psychometrics will be much better because this time you're actually giving. So you've added another dimension, not just about learning, but also quality of your Absolutely. Your that's a really good, um, good point. We should do that. Oh, I'd actually do the so PSA TBL would be, so in fact, we have people from Lambs here, from Sony and, and, and Patrick, you know, you guys here, we, are, we want to use VSAs in TBL. And if the system enabled us to do the market as we're doing the, the TBL, so currently the TBL does SBAs, but with VSAs taking about under a minute to mark, you could say that you're, while the students are discussing, in that five minutes, the facilitator could be marking and they're showing the answers. Uh, the other thing we're doing, I've just, just mentioned it, we have a new, um, a, a new type of questions coming on after the ESS called the CPQ, the clinical prioritization questions, where we're getting the students to actually say us which answer is the most likely diagnosis. Because life is not about single best, life is about the uh, order of likelihood. Um, sorry, Doug. No, I didn't mean No, I, I think it slightly relates to that, but it's about one thing you haven't talked about with the ESA, I think, unless I missed it, but it seems to offer different opportunities for feedback to students mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Absolutely. And the feedback, you know, I'll show them. So I said, anonymously, if you look up and say, somebody is prescribed 100 units of that traffic, that is not correct. The reason you're doing it probably is because, or is, are you comfortable to say why you want to do it? So we have, we've, take, we've taken the approach of giving feedback to the whole class um, of, well, like TBI, like two floors, we have two floors that sat down in front. So I take half the class, my fellow takes the other half, and we say, here is the answers you've given. Here is the range of things we accepted, here is the range of things we didn't accept. And they all look at it and it gives them a lot of um, insight into what other what their peers are thinking as well. So I'm wondering how do you think this will all change if in, in let's say ten years from now actual doctors are using computers and artificial intelligence to prevent the kinds of mistakes that they're now highlighting in, in students' answers, because this happens in clinical practice as well. One of the main reasons to import computer programs and actually put in these all these signs and symptoms and then get the right single answer. Um, That's a really good question. Well, how how is this all going to change? This is a really good question. So, I a couple of weeks ago I asked for a for an Uber to go to Charing Cross uh, to do some hacking uh, stuff, and the sat nav was broken. And this guy who was trying to take me from A to B, we should know it would take 10 minutes, had absolutely no idea where he was going. Because he was so dependent on the machine. Um, and he was giving him the wrong address. So he was saying, you have to go. And I said, I can't. This is not the correct answer. We need to be going this way. Between Hammers and Channing Cross, I do that four times a day. And he was taking me to some other part of it. And I, it made me think, reflect that what if the machine in this new era of AI, and we, we had somebody mentioned this here, makes a mistake, because machines do make mistakes. Do the doctors then, can, do they have the ability to actually sense check, the reality check? Will anyone actually say, hang on, this machine is telling me the diagnosis is X, doesn't actually make any sense. Do we still need to have that ability to reality check, to sense check? Or are we so dependent that if they say, this man with chest pain, sweating, nausea, left arm, is well, discharged them, that somebody will just say, yeah, the machine says discharged them. Well, they go, hang on a minute, these the principles tell me there's something wrong. Uh, the same, same thing with the boiler. If my boiler is broken, I have no idea what the numbers are. But the man who knows something about it will come and say, actually, this is not correct. So the ability to sense check reality, to check knowing the principle, unless if you believe that the machine will be 100% all the time right, we then have to have people who can do some sort of reality check, sense check. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, so that maybe we don't. We I don't keep know. I don't training medical students for that sense check, which they probably don't need to do. Very rarely. Awesome. Exactly. And you can train them in different ways. You can train them that the actual are or a pain or something as well. Yes. And they need to do that. Just keep, of course, using their common sense. But these mistakes of actually prescribing something in a hundred times the dose that they should be prescribing, that's stuff that shouldn't happen today in any hospital anywhere in the planet. It's still happening. 
it, it should happen. And we have every week we have a prescribing mistake of the week. So we have CERN at Imperial. We, we, have, we don't have any paper prescribing. And you can't prescribe 100 new because it's, it's the machine stops you. And there are still prescribing mistakes happening every week because people are still managing to, to prescribe that. Uh, the latest example for us was uh, somebody prescribing DDAVP. So we give desipressin for diabetes and syphilis for people missing the, the born with the pituitary. And um, it's also given for other indications, immunological, etc. And somebody given 10 times the dose. This patient sodium him, so he dropped from 140 to 110. Was that, uh, and I thought it could, it could still happen even with the electronic prescribing, etc. And you're absolutely right to train people who can do sense check, reality check in case the machine goes wrong. Then it's a different. That's the same like training pilots. You don't have pilots to fly. You know, the way they did 30 years ago is it goes from one to two practicing that the case the computers break down and you want them to be able to do it in their rare case. But you still would want them to use the computer. Yes. Every flight they do. At least that's what I would prefer as a customer as a customer. That's a that's a really good question. I don't know if anybody has a that's a thing that I cough often struggle with because Martha keeps asking me, we really need to teach people all this content. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and I, I'm increasingly, uh, I had to, sorry, I'll come back to you in a second. Yeah, Andy sure. Elder, who was the director of MRCP, um, who we worked together on you know, a number of things at GMC, has gone to Stanford. Uh, and he's now doing, he, he's gone to Stanford, he sent an email, really popular, illuminating email, saying increasingly people are arguing that the uh, enhanced augmented intelligence will obviate the need for learning lots and lots. And what is the role of the doctor before, you know, of, of the future? I think so, it comes back to what we were discussing this morning. Take all of this out of patient doctor interaction. There's time for other things, for picking up on facial expressions and, and learning about personal circumstances and bringing that into the treatment. Perhaps. And just having a, some sense of security that the prescription and the diagnosis um, are enhanced with use of artificial It frees up time for those important things. Absolutely. Yeah. Could I link that to actually what we've been talking about in terms of DSA? Because I what one should be doing is saying, well, how do you use this automated yeah. system, knowledge system to help you answer the DSA? And there's a DSA in the future, and you have to be an open book exam using other sources of information. Open work exam. Or about open work So that's another, I mean, the DSA opens up the opportunity to make it an open book exam. So, okay, now, obviously, then you've got all the responses, you've got the apps, what would you do? Yeah. Whereas with the, so that might be one possibility of, of doing this. Thing. Sorry. That's all right. Now, now I have uh, two comments and one question. First, um, I'm actually a pilot, <laughs> um, so I appreciate the, the analogy. And actually, in, in aviation, 90% of the accidents are human factors related, um, which is sort of what we're doing right here. But the second thing that's an interesting point is, are we sort of testing the right thing today? What we'll test 10 years from now will probably be different. But I'd actually argue that this exercise will actually probably create the training to do the AI to stop the prescribing these students. Uh, in the future. So this is probably a necessary step along that path. Um, but actually my question was slightly different. Was have you looked at the impact of academic integrity on the multiple choice question versus the short answer? Or is there less issues with academic integrity or cheating when you go to the short answer versus the multiple choice question? We have it, but it's okay. a very interesting, very interesting question. Uh, you have actually, you've really nailed it on that. So we are, so one of the other things that I've been very um, inspiring to do is use artificial intelligence to generate questions. So it's taken us about five years nationally, all medical schools together, to generate 7,000 questions. Um, with, with machine learning, with input, because machine learning requires a lot of input. So with all the answers coming from the VSAs, that provides the food for the machine and that provides the actual fuel to then generate a large volume of questions. So if we can get this working and actually people are writing, giving us the data, then that might um, promote automated item generation, the AIG, which is you then generate within 10 minutes 20 variations of the same question. So you become much more efficient in generating the items for exams. So you can use the VSA as a, as a vehicle, if you like, as you said, for generating items. Yes? I made a comment about the team we were discussing earlier. We all know the technology and standardization and uh, automation of 20 years ahead of clinical science, and it's much less varied in the But even with all this uh, years of experience, we still pick up errors human, with human eyes in our automated systems, and then we put a stop to the testing and the fresh So 
I don't think we'll ever reach a stage where in, in clinical practice which is so complex in our like laboratory test that we can rely entirely on the machine or which is the correct time. You're absolutely right, and I think that there was a very interesting article in clinical chemistry recently saying, you know, with clinical chemistry, recognizing high potassium or low potassium, high calcium, that's much easier, and it's still not being utilized at the moment. You still have the clinical chemist looking at the results. So, but, you know, I, I, I am still challenged by Martin all the time that at what point do you say you have to stop learning all this large volume of information and actually free up more time as samosas to, to, to concentrate on the more human aspects uh, of, of medicine. And there are other people who push back and say you can be very nice but you show nothing to the patient or normally be short classes. But someone is very nice but doesn't actually know. But do you really need to know all that? That's much? always posed as a dichotomy. Yes. Would you rather have a surgeon who's skilled or do you want him or her to be nice? Why do I have to choose? Exactly, it's not like me. It's yeah. actually, you want to have a nice surgeon who knows what they're doing. Yes, and I think if they're nice and listen to me, they're probably more likely to do the right thing once they have to meet you. Absolutely. But you, you still, we still haven't answered your question in that do you really need to be able to answer the, the yeah. BSA question because the, the machine will tell you what the answer is. Yes. It remains to be. I think it will be hard to move away from this because we're all so used to it and medical students pride themselves in all the results and we still have it. We loved having all these lists in our heads and we had to get the right answer and like that. Yeah, I don't know. And then you make quite a compelling case for these days, I'm quite happy with this. So why do you think that we need to have us in this world, do you not really need to do it? In your dream world, we wouldn't have them at all. We need the, I, I can't see the role of dream. Absolutely. I mean, I, we are working with someone <laughs> 20 years of literature. When I started doing this with people in you know, early conversations, they said, well, the correlation is quite strong with SVPSA, and if there's a good correlation, and then I thought, well, how do I answer this question about correlation? I came up with a height and weight and said, well, there's a very strong correlation with the height and weight. If you plot the nation's Singaporean heights and weights, you will see a strong, you know, there's a very strong correlation. But it doesn't stop you if somebody says, well, you know, their height, you don't stop measuring the weight. The correlation doesn't mean you can stop. Uh, and ignore completely the other, the other construct. Um, I think we are, we have a lot of question bands, all SBAs, the faculty is all very familiar with them. And also currently, the VSAs really work with answers that are between one to five words. Because if they're longer, the machine, but with, with more NLP, natural language processing, if you have a, an, a, a, an answer that says, I would like, you know, the patient's daughter is asking you for some information and you want to say, well, we will not disclose information because it is breaching confidentiality. Mm -hmm. That sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But then, I would argue that should be an SBA. If you're communicating about not giving information, that should really be in the form of an OSCE. Mm -hmm. So communication ethics to be tested in SBAs, professionalism, is really not the, not the correct instrument. <laughs> because it's easy, right? Yeah. And I, I would also argue that if you looked at the, if you looked at our bank, and we're only at five years old medical school, our SBAs are not all SBAs. And I would imagine that, that the same in the UK. We call them SBAs, it doesn't mean they are SBAs. Well, They're disguised through false questions. Well, we have done some more work, which I didn't show you, where I gave the students SBAs, BSAs, and we did libraries with them. So Oscars, Objective Structure, Knowledge Assessment, and uh, Structure Finder. Uh, and there were some students who could actually, who would have given the correct answer in the SBA, but couldn't communicate the management plan. So that's the other problem. You could write the yeah, you could select. The problem with, you always ask what's the next best thing to do for an asthmatic, and it's a nebulizer, or it's to give it a prednisolone. Whereas in real life, you have to write a list of four things to do with this patient. Uh, and SBAs, or all the essays, will not do this. They will ask you what is the single thing you will do next. What do we want to do next? which is our next report, you know, the project we're hoping to do, is to do multiple VSAs, so the machine to mark multiple steps in the management. Because that's what happens if you see your surgeon in a very conversation, they don't need one thing, they'll do a list of things. But currently, all these tests are about what is the thing you can do next. It's a bit of control. But my issue, I think, is that we need to use different kinds of assessments, different kinds of subjects. You can't say that SBA is the best for you, and you say, 
Because some of the questions that we write are, tell me what I'm thinking. Yes. And with an SBA, you can see what you're thinking. Mm. Um, but with a VSA, you can't. Mm. So I, I think it makes the, the priority for properly constructed question. Absolutely. I mean, I was, uh, the, 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 I keep going back to the day I spent in Cambridge last week. With six, uh, we, we had six Cambridge students. I spent the whole day with three of them, about two, three hours with each of them to talk through their full process. And it was amazing. They would get to the same, to the, to the answer in the SD and the VSA. They still found the VSA more difficult than the answer to which one more difficult than VSA. And these are really bright kids who, uh, you know, we, we, had, we were blind to how they did in, in the SBAs. But you could see that actually tech, they did more mental work. They had to do more. But they still got there. They still got to the, to the answer uh, with the VSAs. Or sometimes, you know, when they were thinking along the right lines. At my own, but got the wrong answer. But they could have got it right the first time around if they knew that, that was a test for that seeing the cues. It's quite illuminating actually to, to see them think through the whole process. For me, for you know, I've been doing assessments for like 12 years now. And it was the first time I could actually see how, what happens in the head of a medical student. I'm just wondering, I'm trying to, you, you presented a lot of data, but how we can use this, or how you adapt it to use it for, for progressive testing, because, and, and, um, and whether, because weaker students tend to do worse, whether if you use this, if you define a weaker student as someone who's earlier in their education, whether, whether the performance would be different. Uh, I mean, we, we, we know that 
sort of using the progress test of Manchester across the years, the weaker students do worse in the progress test early on, but effectively their learning curve is steeper, but they may actually never get to be as good as, pe as people who did well at the beginning. And I, I'm just trying to think uh, how, how this would fit into that. Um, not, not, you know, not, not replacing SBA, but just how, how one could use it in terms of progression. Excellent question. We're going to answer that question to some extent in the first week of January. So I have ethics to run the same set of questions on the same set of students who are now year 60s. So, so, what, I'm going to, so you saw that six, 60 questions I presented. Yeah. I'm going to give them to the same students who are now in year 6 oh, okay. as BSAs and SBAs. So I think it's 4th of January. We're going to run this at um, Southampton. So then I will be able to see the growth and what's happened, because it's, it's the best control you can have, it's the same people. It's the same people three years down the line, what's, going to, what's happened to their BSA growth, SBA growth. But if they're still like that, I will have to commit suicide. <laughs> because after three years of being in medical school, you would have expected some sort of something must have happened by now. That's smart to do that. I'm so keen on computer-assisted diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for progress testing, um, the whole issue for this would be about standards. Yeah, and it, it would be there would be too much noise, too much statistical noise in, in years one or two um, to be able to do this method. But, uh, right. You'd have to comb. Hmm? You'd have to use comb if you wanted to. Well, you comb. No, comb doesn't work in progress testing. That's that's, that's the problem. Because, um, it's the, particularly in the early year. Or for the end, you've yes. got the. the the stability of the of the United States Senate. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of sold on the idea, I'm, I'm with you. The only thing I could come up with is it seems like you indicated you could test about three times as much material because the short answer, or the multiple choice is 25 minutes, but the very short answer is 75 minutes. Okay. Is that, is that sort of a constraint? So, so we have now learned that yeah. this is interesting. So we yeah. gave people two hours to do the BSAs nationally, and I was getting phone calls from all these medical schools, and they all finished the BSA. So it doesn't take, it takes actually not that long to do the BSA. Oh, okay. The same as their space, then it should them. They are, you either know it or you don't. Right. And it doesn't take that long to write ASLA. Yeah. So even though we thought we'd give them more time, for the writing, it, yeah. it takes, if anything, it, it, it doesn't take longer. Okay. So, okay. Because you, they either know or they don't know. Right. And those who finished, which was the majority, were just yeah. sitting there waiting. Because the study was do the BSA and wait until everyone's finished. Yeah. Then the BSBAs. Yeah. And almost everybody was finished within an hour. And we had a whole hour trying to get for people who were doing nothing. Okay. Yes. I mean, one of the things that you mentioned is that um, when, uh, or one of the things that you want to explore in the future is this idea to have multiple answer here. Uh, yes. So, do you see that as, as uh, or the reason for that is because there's a process to the right answer. It's like, first I would take an uh, x-ray and then I would actually do this. Answer. So there's a... There's multiple a, parallel things. So, okay, so let's talk about that. So effectively, but is, is things happening in parallel or is the sequential more? So the sequential one, we're going to crack the CDQs. So currently we're trying to develop with a colleague, Variety Kin, to do clinical prioritization questions where people can do one, two, three, four, five. Right. The problem with parallel steps is that if you set what is the differential diagnosis of this, and differential diagnosis was pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, mm. exacerbation of asthma. If somebody wrote pneumonia as number one and chest infection as number two, the machine would give them two marks because they're giving two different things, but they're actually the same thing. So people would very quickly clock the fact that they can actually get four marks by saying the same thing in four different ways. So the machine will have to learn no yeah. to exclude. And that's what, when it becomes a bit complicated, where you have to say, if someone has said pneumonia, then do not give them a mark if they say chest infection. And if that, if they said chest infection, don't give them a mark if they say pneumonia. Now, to me, that mustn't be that difficult, but we yeah, still have yeah. nobody still managed to <laughs> crack this. Um, we're working on it. Maybe, maybe that's something that we can work with your AI, AI, with your, uh, AI people to, uh, to crack, because there's some computer you know, AI literate people. That mustn't be that difficult. I can't imagine that that is. For the parallel. For the parallel answers, yes. Thank you very much, everyone. Really enjoyed the session.